Hey there, good to see you. Today in this video, we're going to take a close look at editing black and white images using Nick Silver Effects from DxO. If you've never heard of Silver Effects before, this is a desktop photo editor that is compatible with both Mac OS and Windows, and you can use it as a standalone application just with, you know, files from your local hard drive, or you may use it as a plugin with Adobe Lightroom and Photoshop. This software is only for creating black and white images. No color, no raw file support either. And I know what some of you right now are probably thinking. You're probably thinking, well, can't I just create a black and white photo using Lightroom or Photoshop? And the answer to that question, of course, is yes. You don't need a specialized photo editor just for black and white when the majority of people can just use what they currently have. But for those photographers who really care about the nuances of black and white photography, for those who want realistic grain, uh, accurate film emulations based on classic film stocks from, you know, Kodak, Ilford, Agfa, and others. For those who want more nuance and control with their tonality and their contrast and their micro contrast, Silver Effects is truly the only photo editor out there for this type of use. We're going to take a look at the application itself, going to take a look at how it interfaces with Adobe Lightroom. I'm going to share with you some recommendations on how to prepare your color raw images before you import them into Silver Effects. Going to take a look at the user interface and we're going to get into some of the technical bits and details about the different tonality and contrast and micro contrast tools that are in it. Uh, to help visualize and explain what they are and what they do. Let's jump into Silver Effects. So we're in Adobe Lightroom now, and let's say that you want to uh, edit a color raw image in Silver Effects. Well, to do that, you just right click anywhere on the image and you can do this in the develop view or the library, and then just go to edit in and then choose Silver Effects from the menu. When you do so, you will then see this modal window here, and it's going to ask you what type of file you want to create to edit um, in SilverFX because SilverFX cannot edit raw nor can any other plugin in the Nick collection. TIFF is fine for file format. For color space, I would recommend setting this to Pro Photo RGB. Uh, reason being, uh, then we're capturing more color information in that conversion from color to black and white. Even though we are editing a, a monochrome image and color space isn't quite as important. For peace of mind and just to make sure that, you know, I'm not arbitrarily limiting my color, I, I just select Pro Photo RGB. Uh, 16 bits for bit depth, that's good. Resolution, you could do you know, 240, 300, whatever feels right to you. And compression, just set that to none. And we have edit a copy with Lightroom adjustments uh, selected up here, and that's fine. Uh, we're gonna take a look at edit original a little bit later, but that'll do for now. And let's just go ahead and open this in, uh, in Silver FX, and then we'll come back to Lightroom and talk about the raw file here in just a moment. And the interface of Silver Effects is more or less the same as you know pretty much every photo every photo editor out there. I mean, you have a bunch of you know developed settings over here in the far right column. You have some zooming and some before and after comparison tools up here in the top menu, and then the left menu are a bunch of presets. And these are you know, some of these are kind of like take them or leave them. I mean, some of these are pretty good, some of them are a little much, but at least they give you a nice you know kind of like place to give you some creative inspiration and to be thinking about you know, what the possibilities are and where you would like to go with an image. Also over here in the left column, there is, uh, oh, by the way, you can also save your own presets, your own custom ones if you want to. There's also this panel here, which I think is pretty cool, called Last Edits. And Silver Effects just basically stores automatically for you, uh, you know, settings that you have used with other images and has automatically record and, and recorded and captured those settings. So I can just come in here and, you know, choose different looks and I can get, you know, the same exact look that I applied to another photo really quickly and easily using these options. And if you don't want a preset or anything, just come up here to the top of the panel and select neutral and then you are back to the original file. Speaking of the original file, down here underneath the uh, preview, you will see a checkbox for non-destructive edits. Now this option is really interesting because even though SilverFX is not technically a non-destructive raw photo editor, it does have non-destructive editing capabilities. It takes all of the settings that you apply to an image, any control points or lines that you create, and it saves all of that information as metadata with the original TIFF file. And that TIFF file behaves just like a normal TIFF image. You can open it in Photoshop, you can do, you know, you can print it, you can do whatever you want with it. But when that TIFF image is open in Silver FX, well then you can go in and you can tweak all the settings. You will see all the settings and everything that you applied to it originally. And you can go in and make whatever adjustments you want. You can even reset it all the way back to the to the very beginning 
if you want to. The only downside here really is file size. When a TIFF is saved with non-destructive editing enabled, that file is like two to three times larger than a normal TIFF uh, would be, but I think it's absolutely uh, worth checking and using. We're gonna go back to Silver Effects in just a moment, but I wanna share with you some recommendations for preparing a color raw file for Silver Effects before you start editing it. What we need to do here is create a better baseline for Silver Effects to, uh, to work with. And the first step in that would be enabling profile corrections, removing chromatic aberration, anything like that. And you could do that here in Lightroom, or you could use a tool like DxO Pure Raw for that uh, as well. And the other thing I would recommend doing is, especially with a high contrast image like this, you can see in my histogram up here that you know, my tonal values are pretty far to the left and right of the histogram. What I typically do is, uh, well, first, I want to make sure that, you know, my colors are are how I want them. And I'm not particularly a big fan of Adobe Color. I'd much rather use uh, a camera profile. So I'm going to use Canon Standard here because this was shot with a Canon R5. And then I want to bring in some of this contrast a little bit. So to do that, I'm just going to pull down the contrast slider. Uh, also going to pull in the highlights a little bit. Lift the black some. Basically squeezing... Uh, more of the tonal information towards the middle. Now, of course, you can come down here and make you know adjustments using the tone curve and all that if you really want to get into it. Maybe adjust exposure as well. The idea here is just creating a nice malleable image for uh, for silver effects to begin working with. And, uh, and that also goes for things like color, temperature, tint, if you need to color correct the image. Anything like that, I would recommend doing beforehand. So to begin a black and white edit in Silver Effects, what I recommend doing is skipping the like entire top portion of this right column over here. This is where you would normally start in a tool like Lightroom, but in Silver Effects, I think it makes more sense to begin with color filter. Now this panel here, this uh, emulates the behavior of real world, physical, tangible color filters used by black and white photographers that are threaded onto the end of a camera lens. And so by choosing blue here, my blue sky is now brighter and the rocks in the foreground are now darker. Whereas if I choose orange, well, the inverse happens. The rocks in the foreground, which are orange and yellow in color, they now get brighter and the sky gets a little bit darker. And by the way, there are additional controls here to dial in a very specific hue and control the strength of the effect, uh, which is something you definitely could not do with a with a traditional color filter. But I like starting with this. I, th I think it's a good way to uh, to begin an edit. Then with the color filter applied or not applied, if you just want to you know, go for neutral, that's perfectly fine. The next step I recommend uh, using is the film types dropdown. Now by default, this is set to neutral, which means that nothing has been assigned. But if you look in here, you will see that there are all these classic black and white film stocks in here organized by box speed. So there's everything from you know, 800, 400, 200, 125, 100 ISO, and a lot of brand names you'll recognize uh, you know, like Fuji, Ilford, Kodak, of course, and and others as well. And let's just click on one here so you can see uh, what exactly happens. So I'm going to choose, let's just do uh, Ilford Pan uh, 400. And when you choose a film emulation, there are three things that happen. First, you get grain. And let me just come in here really close so... Uh, so we can see it. And this emulates the appearance of film grain from that, you know, from that particular film stock. And you have some controls here that you could be using to, you know, be further tweaking and dialing that in. Then underneath that, you have color sensitivity, the different hues of the color spectrum here. And again, you can use this here to brighten or darken uh, different areas of your shot. And then finally down here, we have the levels and curves. And this is, of course, a tone curve interface here. Now, while we're in here, there's one quick thing I want to show you that's really interesting. This curves interface here, if you grab the black point or the white point for that matter and lift it up and down or move it around, you see what's happening? You notice how all the other nodes on the curve here are moving with it? That is something that I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't think there's a way to do that in Lightroom, like a keyboard shortcut or something, but that would be so awesome. I love this. I, I guess it probably not for everyone, but I love having the ability to, you know, set the actual like contrast curve that I want and then make some fine tuned adjustments to the black point and the white point of the image, but without having to then go in and move the other nodes around. Like I think I think that's really pretty awesome. And then underneath levels and curves, you'll see another panel labeled film grain. Now this is a little bit confusing because it's kind of weird having, in my opinion at least, having two different grain 
uh, tools. But you know, once you kind of wrap your head around it, it's it's not that bad. And I'll, I'll show you. So in this second film grain panel here, when this drop down is set to original, that means that the grain that you see in the image is coming from the grain associated with the film emulation assigned under film types up here further above. But let's say that we don't want a film emulation. Like we don't want to be uh, starting with that. We just set this back to neutral and then come down here to the second film grain panel, open it up. And now we have these film emulation options inside of here. And when you apply one of these, you are not only affecting the, the contrast and the tones in the image, but you're also applying film grain uh, <laughs> as well. And you can control the intensity of the grain and the, and the size of the grain and all that. So yeah, it's a little bit weird, but I think the reason for it is for people who want to edit an image themselves without choosing a film emulation, and they just want to apply, you know, a film grain that looks authentic, that looks good, you know, from a particular film stock, but without completely and totally emulating that particular film. So again, I wish there was some way of integrating the two, but that's how it, it currently is. By the way, in case you're curious to know, film grain in Silver FX does look different than film grain from Adobe Lightroom. There's something about film grain in Adobe Lightroom that has always looked like a little flat, uh, you know, a bit like just a pattern or overlay, just kind of like thrown on top of an image. Whereas the film grain in Silver FX, it feels more integrated. It feels more tailored for, you know, the tonal range of an image, like in the shadows and the darkest regions in Lightroom. And you start to see almost like white pixels in those areas. Whereas the grain in Silver FX to my eyes looks much better and looks more natural. Okay, so then with the film emulation assigned, then I typically return back up here to the top of the panel. And then the tonal and contrast adjustments that I make to the image are then being performed underneath the film emulation uh, that is applied thereafter. And one thing I like about Silver Effects up here in the brightness adjustment panel, you'll see that there is a mid-tone slider. This is, <laughs> this is something that uh, has never really been part of Lightroom. Well, I guess actually in Lightroom, it's the exposure slider is kind of, has always kind of served as the midtone slider. And there is a midtone slider actually in the color grading panel in the in the midtones area. You can raise and lower the luminance slider there in order to affect the midtones. But it's kind of cool having a having a dedicated midtone slider. Now the brightness slider up here at the top is a bit of a, a blunt instrument. It's it's pretty aggressive. It's um it's not a particularly smart tool. A better one I think is dynamic brightness down here because this one has a little more intelligence going on behind the scenes. It doesn't blow out your highlights and your whites quite as much or you know ruin the the contrast of the image. It just does a better job and a smarter job I think of raising and lowering the brightness of the image um, but in not you know, it's such an aggressive way like the brightness slider up here does. And then next we have contrast adjustments. So now here we have a similar relationship uh, between contrast and soft contrast. Contrast is like, it's, it's pretty aggressive. It's not a particularly nuanced tool, whereas soft contrast is actually really interesting. If we crank up soft contrast, notice what's happening to the contrast in the image and notice what's happening to the brights and the whites in the image. And actually, this might be easier to see with a with a grayscale ramp. Check this out. If I use contrast, it basically behaves like contrast in any other tool, right? I mean, the you know the the shadows are getting darker, the whites are getting brighter. But if we do soft contrast, watch the highlights up here just above the midtones. Watch what they do. You see what's happening? It's adding contrast, but it's also blooming and diffusing the whites a little bit, which is really interesting. Again, if we go back to contrast, see how, you know, see how the division between the different bands is more well-defined, whereas with soft contrast, it definitely, definitely gets glowier and it definitely gets more of that diffuse look. And for me, I like that a lot because it's actually pretty similar to the Orton effect in landscape photography, that, that, uh, that Gaussian blur technique in Photoshop where you kind of bloom and soften up the highlights to add a little bit of glow and make light look more like light and not quite as clinical and technical as you oftentimes get with, with uh, digital photography. So I love this soft contrast tool in, in Silver FX. I think it's really cool. Uh, so the next tool is structure adjustments. Now, 
uh, structure is DXO's terminology for micro contrast, which Adobe would call clarity. If we turn up structure here, let's just begin with that. What happens here is that it is increasing the contrast within each tonal step in the image. Instead of applying contrast across the entire image, it's just applying, uh, it's, it's selectively applying contrast within each band. And that's why uh, it looks beveled when I increase the, the structure here. So it's looking for areas of division and contrast in the image. And when it finds it, it adds a little bit of darkening to the left and a little bit of brightening uh, to the right. And it does that anywhere it finds it. And so that basically brings out or, or creates the appearance of more detail and texture in the image. And then we have here selective control over where structure is applied in the image. And we can choose between the highlights, the midtones, and the shadows and control the degree of structure that is added to each one. So you can see when I crank up the highlights, only the top end of the grayscale ramp is affected and nothing underneath. If we do the midtones, well, everything in the middle receives it. And then if we do the shadows, the darker end of the grayscale ramp uh, receives uh, structure. And I really like this because it means for me in the type of photography that I typically do, which is landscape, it means that I can create the appearance of more detail and texture in the darker areas or even the like the midtones of the image, but leave the highlights alone, leave the brightest areas of the image alone so that they appear softer, so that I'm increasing the clarity of the image but not adversely affecting the appearance of light, the appearance of, you know, like the sky, the brighter areas where I want them to be softer. I don't want to increase clarity there typically. I just want to increase that micro contrast in those darker areas. And then finally down here at the bottom, there is fine structure. Now this is essentially a global change, just like the structure slider up here, except it just has more nuance. Okay, so another really interesting and unique tool in SilverFX is tonality protection. Now this tool does exactly what it describes. It protects the shadows and the highlights and helps keep them from clipping when the brightness values and when the contrast of the image is raised and lowered. It effectively protects details and textures in the darkest and the brightest areas of the image. And to illustrate how this works, we're going to edit this image here. Now this one, uh, I actually captured this at night. I think this was like a 60 second expo exposure, something like that. Um, you know, long exposure because I didn't want, you know, any, uh, any noise in the image. I wanted it to be, you know, as clean as possible. But, you know, creatively, it's not supposed to look like this. It's, it's supposed to be, you know, much more low key, uh, more of a, like a nighttime moody kind of image, you know, more something like this. But the problem here is that some of you may already be able to tell by dropping this brightness down, we're getting some areas of the image, some regions here that are clumping up, uh, that are bunching up together and are turning flat because those pixels are being clipped. And actually we can confirm that by coming up here and turning on our uh, warning. And anything that you see here uh, that is painted white, that is effectively a dead pixel. There's no detail, there's no texture, there's nothing there. It's just a, it's just a flat area of, <laughs> of solid black. I want the image to be dark and to be low key, but I don't want to be losing that detail and texture. So let's just keep it right there. We're going to go back to tonality protection here and watch what happens when I raise the shadow slider. All of a sudden, all of those dark tones, all of those pixels that were lost by dropping the brightness down so low, they have now come back uh, fully formed. I've now brought back all of the detail and texture that were in those darkest areas by raising shadows all the way up to 100%. Now, obviously, I don't have to, you know, raise this all the way to 100 if I don't want to, if that looks a little too, you know, fake or phony or, you know, something like that. Sometimes it can. I can bring this back down and just find, you know, like an acceptable level of clipping. You know, you don't have to get rid of all clipping unless you really want to, but some degree of clipping is sometimes perfectly fine, you know, like especially in areas where people aren't going to notice anything, where people wouldn't expect to see detail and texture anyway. You know, you don't really have to remove all of it, but uh, let's just say for the sake of argument that we, that we do want to. So I'm going to crank this back up to 100. And now let's come back up here and watch what happens. If I now make tonal adjustments to the image. I can pull the shadows all the way down. No clipping, nothing happening there. I can crank up the contrast if I want to, and the image gets darker. A little bit of clipping is starting to come in now, but still I'm not losing the detail and texture in those darkest areas. I can amplify the blacks if I want to, uh, which still is not having that much of an effect. Let's try dropping the brightness even more. 
yet again, still not losing any information. So it's almost like by cranking that up to 100, it's it's almost like it's putting a barrier, like a wall down here at the bottom, but it rolls off those values very smoothly. So you don't, it doesn't look fake. Like you don't get, uh, you, like you still get that tonal roll off. You know, I think you get the idea of what's happening here. So, you know, by protecting those, those darkest shadows, we're able to then more effectively work you know, on the midtones, on the shadows, and, you know, get the tonal adjustments exactly right without worrying about those dark pixels spilling over into pure black. And by the way, of course, with the highlight slider here, there are no highlights really in this image, but if there were, and I crank that up to 100, it would be exactly the same, uh, just at the other end of the, of the tonal range. Really, really cool uh, tool here in Silver FX. So after you have, you know, optionally assigned of a, a film emulation and you've, you know, made some global adjustments to an image, the next thing you might want to look into is applying a selective adjustment. And this is similar again to the masking tools in Lightroom. You just click on either a radial or linear adjustment. And when you do radial, uh, you know, this is actually like one of the more historical aspects of Nick collection. Like as soon as you see this, it, it well, at least for me, it brings back memories because this has been part of Nick Collection for a very, very long time and was really a pretty you know, advanced thing when it first came out. Because when you place this control point over an area of the image, it's almost like it has luminosity and color masking built into it. Because check this out, if I, where is, um, where is brightness? Okay, so here's brightness. If we just crank up brightness and I place this over the blue area of the sky, or if I move it here, notice how the effect completely changes depending on what is directly underneath this control point. And then we have uh, control lines, which are effectively like a linear gradient you know, tool in Lightroom. This is just a, like a linear gradient that you drag onto the image wherever you want it to go. Uh, and then you have similar tools here to be adjusting, you know, tonality and contrast. But this is a little bit different than control point because control lines, this little orange circle here, it doesn't care you know, what's underneath. It doesn't pay attention to the image. It's not masking it in any way. It's just a layer that's just basically, you know, placed on top of, uh, on top of the image. It's not as advanced and it's not as intuitive or easy to use as the new masking tools that are available in Lightroom. You know, Lightroom, it just really like set the new standard, I think, when it comes to adding, subtracting, intersecting masks and doing sophisticated things with them. I know I love it and I, and I know that um, I use it uh, quite a lot. So the tools here, while they're fine, you know, they're just, they're not quite as good. I especially do not like the little white pills that hang off the, the bottom of the control point. You know, maybe that was fine ages ago when it first came out, back when people are using like 800 by 600 resolution CRT displays and stuff like that. But like on a, you know, like a new 4K display and the increased resolution that we have today, they're really fiddly and they're really just awful. And I just really do not like using them. Fortunately, uh, those settings are mirrored over here in the right column. So you can, you know, use the right column instead, but still, I mean, DxO did improve this interface actually for Photolab, uh, the control points and why that has it migrated over to Silverfax or the Nick collection. I don't know. Okay. And then finally down here at the bottom of the panel, we have finishing adjustments. Now this is uh, this is an area where you're able to layer on some additional uh, toning and some additional effects. In the toning panel here, we have options for split toning. You can do cool colors. You can do obviously things, you know, like sepia, which is, you know, pretty popular. This is just a nice way to be toning the black and white image so it doesn't look quite so neutral. Then underneath that, we have vignette. Well, one of the cool things about the vignette tool in Silver Effects is that you have this center point option here. So when you click on this, you then just choose in your image where you want the vignette, uh, where you want the center of the vignette to be. So you could do it like a little bit off center, like something like that. And that just shifts it a little bit towards the right. And then we have image borders. Now this is kind of like, this is where Nick collection starts to feel nostalgic for me. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's like a, a nineties thing. It, it kind of almost looks like a, like a alternative rock nineties album cover or something, but, but maybe it's generational but that's kind of like the vibe that I get when I look at these. But hey, if uh, if this is, you know, the kind of look you like and you want that to be part of your your uh, your black and white work, you can absolutely do it and you can apply it. 
Okay, there's one important thing that I skipped over earlier that I should have talked about, and that is the histogram. Let's take a look at that. What makes the histogram in SilverFX unique is this row up here. This is the Ansel Adams zone system, the famous zone system with the, with the 10 steps up here. And when you select a zone, you get a pattern and a color over the pixels in the image that fall within that zone. And you can actually do multiple zones if you want. So that's two and three together. And where this is helpful, I think, is with people who you know just really want to follow the, the the principles and the practices of you know of a renowned landscape photographer like Ansel Adams, and they want their highlights to fall within a particular zone, and they want their shadows to fall within a particular zone, and they want to be really meticulous about where those tones are in the black and white image. Well, you can turn on a particular zone and then make tonal adjustments and contrast adjustments underneath and basically move you know those tonal values exactly where you want them either you know brighter into a, a higher zone or lower into a, a lower zone personally i'm not like you know that invested in the zone system i think it's cool i think it's pretty awesome that you know that adams came up with a technique to quantify all these different uh tonal ranges in the in the dynamic range but uh you know but it's there like you know no other tool i'm not aware of another tool that that has that in it and it's um it's pretty cool and it's and it's a it's a nice like nod i think also to the history of of black and white photography as well okay so let's say you've created a black and white image uh, using silver effects and you remember to check that non-destructive edit option what do you do thereafter how do you go back and re-edit that that tiff image again assuming you're using lightroom you go back to lightroom and you right click on the tiff image that was edited you go to edit in silver effects and in this panel now you will see that uh, we now have edit original selected this should be uh, selected by default. If it's not, you want to make sure that you check it. Do not check edit a copy or edit a copy with Lightroom adjustments, because when you edit a copy that strips out all of the settings and adjustments from Silver Effects, it's going to get rid of all of it. It's just going to create a duplicate of the image, unless that for some reason that's what you want. But if you want to go in and edit that image again in a non-destructive way, using all the same settings that you used before and fine tune the image, make sure that you have edit original set here. One final tip here regarding cropping. Now you may notice that uh, SilverFX does not have a cropping tool. So in order to crop an image created in SilverFX, you need to crop it in Lightroom or crop it in Photoshop or some other application. What I would recommend doing when editing color raw images is to apply a crop in Lightroom to a TIFF image after it's been created by SilverFX and not crop the image before it's been opened like crop the, the original raw image, open that, and then work with that cropped version of it. I think it's better, even though it may be a little annoying and it may be like, you know, driving your eyes crazy, you know, like you may just be dying to crop it because the, the composition is wrong or so, you know what I mean? I think it's better to just create a black and white image using the original, the full resolution of that raw file and then apply a crop thereafter. I think in some ways it's kind of remarkable that Nick Collection has lasted this long and is still and is still around because again there are parts of it that are nearly three decades old. Silver FX has been around since uh, 2008, and I think DxO has done a good job of refreshing and modernizing and, and updating Silver FX and some of the other apps that are part of Nick Collection. But that said, it's Silver FX does feel to me like you can still feel its age, like underneath the underneath its uh, facade and i'm like you know i'm running an m1 max you know max studio here so plenty of horsepower to be powering the application and yet it feels sometimes like a little like a little hesitant i think that's the best word to describe it like sometimes you grab something and it kind of you know there's always like a little bit of um a little bit of lag involved in it the app is perfectly usable it's not a problem at all it just doesn't feel quite as snappy and quite as quick as uh, and as modern as, you know, say some of the other applications that you may be using on your desktop. You can definitely kind of feel its age uh, a little bit, but obviously what really matters is the quality of images that you're able to create. And I think, you know, while there's nothing wrong with the black and white tools that are available uh, in Lightroom, you know, the black and white profiles that it has, the black and white presets, and the tools are, you know, perfectly capable and fine. There is something really special about Silver Effects, and there's something that I personally really like about the film emulations. I like the grain, I like the tonality tools, I like the contrast tools, the micro contrast tools. It has a lot going for it. And I think in some ways, if you're like, you know, really passionate about black and white photography, the price tag of the entire Nick collection, I mean, Silver Effects is, is almost like worth, you know, that cost alone, I think. 
It's unique, it's different. Uh, it's uh, a refreshing change actually from using Lightroom all the time. And I like the, I like the results that I'm able uh, to get out of it as well. So if you are also into black and white photography and you want to give it a try, uh, the good news is you can absolutely free. All you have to do is download a free trial of the Nick collection, uh, which uh, Silver Effects is part of. And, uh, and it costs nothing. You can just download it, give it a try and see how you like it for yourself. If you want to do that, there is a link down below in the video description that you can use. Thank you to DxO for providing me with a license for Nick collection version six so I could produce uh, this review for you. And if you enjoyed this video, please take a moment, give it a thumbs up down below and also subscribe to this channel if you would like to hang out and do this again in the future. If you want to watch another video from me, if, you, uh, if you're ready for more, I would recommend uh, checking out is it this way? Yeah, I think it's this. Um, everything's backwards on a monitor. Uh, check out this video over here. I think um, I think you'll like this one. That's it, everyone. I'll see you in the next one.